G'day Earthlings, Dr. Rank here, and welcome to Gaming Legends, the show that puts the eco in eco-friendly. In Jack and Daxter, the Precursor Legacy, you play as Crash Bandicoot's second cousin twice removed, trying to find the antidote for a selectively deadly poison. But let's be honest, all Daxter actually does in this game is sit on your shoulder and weigh you down, which isn't exactly conducive to a platforming game. Can you beat Jack and Daxter, the Precursor Legacy, without jumping? For the sake of convenience, I'll be doing the run on the digital PS4 port of the game sold on the Australian PlayStation Store. This specific version is functionally identical to the PAL PS2 release. Trust me, that matters. For the purposes of this run, any action that both directly gives you height and uses the X button is banned. That means we can't jump, double jump, crouch jump, roll jump, hole jump, jump off ledges, or jump from the surface of water. Additionally, to keep the run interesting, using the L1 and R1 buttons to jump while riding the Zuma is also banned. If we accidentally jump like an idiot, our only choice is to reload a prior save file. The run is complete when we win the final battle against Gol and Maya. Without further ado, let the run begin! We start out in Geyser Rock and we need to collect all four power cells in the area to unlock the teleporter. However, the path to the first power cell is blocked by a staircase, leaving us with no option but to climb it. This serves as an excellent introduction to our main method of gaining altitude, the uppercut. This move is normally performed by pressing the X button after punching, but that method obviously goes against the rules of the challenge. However, we can also perform a crouching uppercut by pressing the square button while crouching, which is perfectly legal. Uppercuts travel slightly higher than Jack's normal jump, but have a lot less horizontal mobility. Fortunately, we can extend our distance by using the uppercut at the very edge of the platform, a technique known as the boosted uppercut. And if that's not enough, we can also get extra hang time by using, you're not gonna believe this, a spin attack! The second power cell is obtained immediately after by finding all seven scout flies in the level, an objective that's also found literally everywhere else. You're normally supposed to break scout fly boxes with a dive attack performed by pressing square in midair. You can still do a dive after an uppercut, but turns out the uppercut itself is also capable of freeing scout flies on its own. Power Cell number 3 is basically the tutorial for Blue Eco, which increases Jack's movement speed, automatically destroys nearby boxes, attracts nearby collectibles, and activates machinery such as these doors. Plus, if Jack collects Eco while in a normal, grounded state, he automatically jumps in the air slightly, allowing him to clear small obstacles basically for free. After collecting the third Power Cell though, we're expected to fall down into the water. Jack isn't allowed to crouch or punch while swimming, making uppercuts inaccessible. The only way out of the water is to either jump out, which isn't an option for obvious reasons, or to swim into an area that's shallow enough to let Jack crouch. And there is such an area right beside the grass. A little ways up, we come to our first major roadblock. The uppercut doesn't quite send us high enough to reach this pillar with the final precursor orb, beyond which rests the final Geyser Rock power cell. We can grab onto the ledge, but from there we can't get up without jumping. We can drop down from the ledge by pressing X while moving away from it, an action that gives you negative height, but that's literally all we can do. But don't throw in the towel just yet, there's another way up. If we go to the back side of this pillar, we can use an uppercut and spin to land on the rock, then do a precise uppercut into the top of the pillar to land on the next one. With that, we can 100% clear Geyser Rock and move on to the game proper. Our main goal is to collect as many power cells as we can to unlock the connector levels that run between each hub world. We need 20 cells to get past Fire Canyon, 45 for the Claw boss fight and mountain pass, and 72 for Lava Tube, with 94 being accessible before then. It is technically possible to bypass these requirements with some fancy flippy tricks, but good luck doing this jumpless. I did go back and forth across the world several times throughout the run, but to keep this video coherent, I'll be talking through the power cells one level at a time. 
Sandover Village is mostly simple, with one power cell requiring us to herd cattle on flat ground, and two more being purchased from NPCs for 90 precursor orbs each. The remaining power cells though were locked behind a short platforming section, and the gaps are simply too wide to cross with just a normal uppercut. You'll have to pull off three boosted uppercuts in a row, climbing all the way back up every time you fail. It took me until right at the end of the run to do it, but after several attempts I finally reached the other side and grabbed the seventh scout fly. Also on this ledge is the Oracle, who will dispense two power cells for 120 precursor orbs each. There are two more oracles found in later hub worlds with identical wares, and while it's theoretically possible to buy each individual power cell, the amount of accessible orbs in this run is slightly more finite than usual. During my run, I made every single NPC purchase first, since it was more economical, and only had enough orbs left over for four out of six oracle purchases. If you buy an oracle power cell you don't need, you could potentially softlock your save file and forfeit the run. Forbidden Jungle's power cells vary wildly in terms of difficulty. Some, like the eco beams, the scout flies, and the one behind this door are cakewalks, while others are a bit more complicated. This power cell rests on an island with no solid ground nearby to stand on, making it impossible to reach from the water. Fortunately, this island is located below a cliff right beside the first eco beam, so we can just drop down onto it instead. There's also plenty of trampolines littered throughout the level, which can't be triggered by an uppercut from below for some reason, instead requiring you to dive into them. The hardest section is the path to the top of the temple, which is littered with launch pads. You'd normally trigger them by jumping with Blue Eco, but for some reason, uppercuts are not an adequate substitute this time. Which is a problem because these launch pads are the only way to the power cell at the top, which also locks multiple other cells behind it. It's here where I must introduce you to a new technique, the Super Dive Attack. When Jack performs a dive, he bounces off the ground a short distance. If you hold the X button during the dive, that distance is increased, matching the height of a crouch jump. I debated even allowing this move, and even tried to go without it at first, but 88% of you are of the opinion that it's perfectly legal. Sorry, Mom, the mob is spoken. Now this move is cool and all, but it also has one other secret attribute. The Super Dive Attack is fully capable of triggering launch pads. This lets us reach the top of the temple, enter the temple proper, activate the blue eco vent switch, and defeat the dark eco plant. The most notable power cell we get here is the fishing minigame, which has no jumping by design, and whose completion grants us passage to Misty Island. The route I took through this level actually went backwards compared to usual, as I didn't trust some of the large pitfalls. Almost every on-foot power cell is obtainable this way, though catching the Sculptor's Muse took a bit of effort to outflank. The Muse's route passes through several mud pits which prevent Jack from crouching if he falls in. You're effectively softlocked if you fall in the mud, basically requiring a save and load to continue. But after several tries, I managed to get the drop on her. Another tricky power cell is this one which can only be reached by activating the Blue Eco platform. The nearest Blue Eco is on the main path with several large gaps in the way. Fortunately, the biggest of these can be cleared with a boosted uppercut and spin, giving us just barely enough time to reach the platform. The last two power cells are obtained while riding the Zuma. The controls for this thing are lifted directly from Crash Team Racing, which means it uses the L1 and R1 buttons to jump, an illegal action in my eyes. Thankfully, the balloon lurkers we need to take out can all be reached from ground level, and while it looks like we need a jump to reach this power cell, just driving off the edge at high speed is just barely enough. In Sentinel Beach, we can easily get three cells from the green eco vents, the seagulls, and just sitting there on the beach proper. Oh, also the one on top of the Sentinel, I forgot about that one. And, now that the blue eco vent is open, we can also use the launch pads to reach the cannon for another power cell. The Flut Flut Egg was slightly harder to reach, but the short platforming course can't do much to stop us. 
However, there's a substantial cache of precursor orbs here that will only open with blue eco. Crouching uppercuts aren't exactly the most fluid way to get around, with accidental rolls often messing up the flow, so getting there in time isn't very practical. There's also two scout flies on high ledges that you're supposed to reach by using the log platforms. We can raise them with uppercuts from below, but reaching them is the hard part. One of them can be reached with a boosted uppercut, while the other can be reached by using the launch pads. The final cell is obtained by punching the pelican roosting on this island, then racing him for the power cell. We can't reach the island from the water as it's too deep to get a proper footing, but the launch pads are close enough to enter from above. It took me a few tries to reach the cell in time, but by tapping the joystick to swim faster, using super dive attacks to skip the stairs, and rolling along the final stretch, I managed to win the race. With almost the entire hub world cleaned out, we can now use the Zuma in Fire Canyon. The main gimmick with this level is that the temperature rises for as long as we're grounded, resulting in automatic death if it gets too hot. However, while we can't simply jump, there's enough ramps and water balloons to keep us cool, and apparently ramming into a lurker gives you insane height on its own so we can easily 100% Fire Canyon and move on to the second hub, Rock Village. All the power cells in Rock Village proper are easy, with only NPC purchases and scout flies. Unfortunately, only two of the three levels here are accessible. The entrance to Lost Precursor City is surrounded by water, and the nearest pontoon is too far away even for a boosted uppercut. That automatically reduces the accessible power cells by 8, which isn't exactly ideal. Precursor Basin is thankfully based entirely around the Zuma, with very little jumping required by design. There are some gaps near the top of the level that are tricky to cross, but we can make it with enough speed. The only power cell we can't get from this area is the one above the lake, as it's just too high and too far to reach without explicitly pressing the jump button. Still, 7 out of 8 isn't too shabby. Then there's Boggy Swamp, which was absolute hell. This level is littered with swamp water that damages you and prevents you from crouching and thus uppercutting. You can still do an uppercut immediately after taking damage if you're quick enough, but if you miss your chance, you're dead. I recommend grabbing some yellow eco whenever possible, as firing a shot in mid-air causes Jack to stall his descent slightly, which can then be followed up with a spin. The path is also littered with poles that you're expected to jump off, but since pole jumps are illegal, touching one basically soft locks us. I was able to get past the first couple by damage boosting off the thorny vines in just the right spot, causing me to bounce right past, which also allowed me to reach the first zeppelin tether for a power cell. But you know what's worse than swamp water and pole jumps? Swamp water AND pole jumps. I tried absolutely everything to get past this section to absolutely no avail. Fortunately, there's another route we can take. If we do a super dive attack near the start of the level, we can get on top of the post attached to the pole, and then on top of the rock. From there, if we do a boosted uppercut, shoot yellow eco, and spin in just the right way, we can reach the end of the level and get the fourth zeppelin tether. Unfortunately, getting beyond this point, while proven possible by speedrunners, was beyond my abilities or patience to achieve. So while it's theoretically possible to get all 8 power cells from Boggy Swamp without jumping, I personally was only able to get 2 of them. Regardless, we do still have more than enough power cells to raise the boulder leading to the claw boss fight. The cliffs leading up to the battle are pretty tall, and even the super dive attack has trouble reaching them consistently. But if you time a spin absolutely perfectly, you can just barely get up there and bank the checkpoint. Claw himself was quite the challenge, with most of the battle moving between platforms over instant death lava. There's just barely enough space to uppercut between them, but you'll need to time it carefully with the boulders. Once the blue eco appears, grab it, uppercut to the bridge, and make extremely careful movements until you reach the yellow eco. 
Repeat twice more, and safe passage into and through Mountain Pass is granted. Volcanic Crater has our final four purchase-based power cells, all from the same character. However, the timing of when you buy them is extremely important. The gondola leading to Snowy Mountain will only usable if we activate the teleporter in the Red Sage's hut and then collect two more power cells afterwards. If you wait too long to turn the teleporter on, you won't have any power cells to collect, making Snowy Mountain inaccessible and potentially denying you the power cells you need to finish the game. Fortunately, I turned on the teleporter as soon as I got there, meaning I had plenty of accessible power cells to open the gondola. The start of Snowy Mountain itself has an extremely wide gap that even a boosted uppercut couldn't cross. I tried doing an uppercut from the Scoutfly box at the bottom of this cliff, but turns out a colorblind programmer at Naughty Dog made the hitbox cover Jack's feet. Luckily, if we uppercut to the outcropping on the left, we can slide along it to reach the other side. The first thing I did once I got over was make a beeline for the yellow eco-vent switch, which was a rather tight platforming course littered with ice, pistons, and moving platforms. You'll need to mix and match just about every technique we've covered so far in a very specific way, but I assure you, it is eventually possible to reach the switch. This opens up the yellow eco vents throughout the game, letting us get the hidden power cell from Mountain Pass, as well as destroy several orb crates in the later levels. The precursor blockers were difficult to land on since they have force fields, but a well-timed super dive attack and spin gets the job done. The lurker infested cave was relatively easy to navigate, but the final jump requires a tight boosted uppercut to reach the power cell. We also need a boosted uppercut to reach the yellow eco vent in this level, which was one of the hardest things I had to do in this run. You need to uppercut off the exact edge of the snow, then spin right at the apex to just barely land on the ice platform. Once you get there, you can grab a scout fly, activate the vents, and open the frozen crates for a power cell. The last two scout flies are inside the lurker fort, but first we need to open the gates. You normally do this by going through a timed platforming course with the flat flat, but the flat flat can only gain height with the X button. Jack's feet aren't exactly the fastest substitute either, seemingly making this task impossible. Fortunately, the switch to open the gate and the power cell attached to it are in a cave entrance right beneath the fort itself. It's a little awkward to simply jump over, but we've got a better strategy. Enter first person view while near a ledge, hold up on the joystick, double tap the triangle button, and repeat. Jack is considered grounded while in first person view, and remains that way for a short moment after exiting it. So if you chain these together, you can essentially walk in mid-air while sacrificing a little height. When you get close to the cave, hold L1 or R1, then press triangle and square in quick succession to uppercut into the cave to reach the power cell. The power cell on the lurker fort itself is unfortunately behind a pole jumping course with seemingly no way to bypass it, but we can just barely reach both of the scout flies here with some extremely precise super dive attacks. Spider Cave only lets us get half the power cells jumpless. We can easily defeat the gnawing lurkers, reach the platform at the top, navigate the spider tunnel, and find all the scout flies. The remaining power cells seem to be locked behind doors with jump-shaped keyholes. There's a power cell at the end of the dark cave, and while we can make it all the way there, we can't make the jump to the power cell itself. And we can destroy most of the dark eco-crystals, but the last one is on the other side of a dark eco-pit that seems to be just too wide to cross. The giant robot has a power cell at the top, and while we can make it surprisingly far, we still fall slightly short. And as for the pole jumping power cell... No, just no. That leaves us with only 71 power cells in total, just one short of our goal. However, there's one power cell in Volcanic Crater that I've conveniently left out until now. This cell is inside an iron crate near the spider cave entrance, and you're supposed to break it with yellow eco. The nearest yellow eco vent is in spider cave itself, but there isn't enough time to get all the way from the vent to the crate with just uppercuts. 
But there's one more secret mechanic we can take advantage of. Yellow eco shots tend to home in on the nearest target, and if we shoot from these pillars, we can just barely lock onto the crate to free the power cell. With our 70 second power cell banked, we can access the final Zuma level, Lava Tube. While it is a lot longer than the other connector levels, our lack of ability to jump doesn't hamper us much here, letting us proceed to the final level of the game, Golan Myers Citadel. The dev intended route through this level is to free the red, blue and yellow sages to unlock a path to the top. But if you think the developer's opinion matters, you have never seen this channel before. When you first enter the level in certain versions of the game, the cutscene sets your checkpoint to the top of the citadel instead of the bottom. If you save your game at this point and then reload that save, you'll skip straight to the top, letting you free Samos and skip the other three sages. Keep in mind, this glitch only works in the American Black Label PS2 version, as well as the European PS2 and PS4 versions. By the time the Red Label, Japanese and PS3 versions came out, the colorblind programmer at Naughty Dog had apparently been fired. Don't worry though, he went on to work at Traveller's Tales. The final battle against Golan Maya is mostly pretty simple, just grab Yellow Eco and keep shooting. Between every phase though, Golan Maya will unleash a nuke onto the battlefield that'll kill you instantly. The only way to escape it is with the launch pad, so it's a good thing we can trigger it with the super dive attack. Phase 3 is the hardest with multiple shockwaves to dodge, but with properly timed uppercuts you can safely avoid them. All we have to do now is touch the light eco, and the battle is over. With Gol and Maya banished to the bottom of the barrel, the Jack and Daxter jumpless run is officially conquered! Before I go, credit has to go to The Stella, who did a speedrun of the game in only a single press of the X button. I use this run for reference pretty frequently, and I highly recommend you check it out. And if you'd like to see the original run in its entirety, you can check out the livestream archives in the description. And be sure to subscribe and ring the bell so you don't miss the next challenge run. That's all for now, and I will see you down under. Ah. Oh. <laughs>